welcome to your basic medical coding course. My name is Tamai Chester. I'll be with you throughout the whole entire course. I've been in the healthcare industry for 17 years, 17 of which I've been a coding professional. I am currently a certified professional coder or CPC and a certified professional medical auditor through AAPC. I received my certified professional coding certificate in 2005 and my CPMA or certified professional medical auditor in 2010. Currently, I work with others in the industry as we discuss ever-changing coding and documentation guidelines. Here are some of your required materials, some recommend, recommended, recommended material, and your optional materials. Your required texts include a current year for ICD-9-CM, also your current year CPT-4, and your current HICSPIX book or Healthcare Common Procedure Coding Systems. Some recommended material is your medic, medical terminology with human anatomy by Jane Rice and a medical dictionary. Optional resources are your anatomy and physiology for dummies and some wonderful web searches like Google. So here's some, some, some statistics or some questions that you may be asking yourself. One, is this career for me? Well, it is true that everything is not for everybody, but if you want a job, pick another field. If you want a career, choose healthcare. What about growth opportunity? The best thing about billing and coding is that it can evolve into another position. Coding is now a platform for so many positions that utilize some form of coding in order to stay relevant. Can I raise a family with this amount of money? Yes, you can. And do I need a degree? No. However, as you get experience or are in interested in becoming a supervisor or manager, some workplaces will require a different certification and even a degree. The last question that a lot of people like to answer, ask themselves are, what am I going to lose? You're going to lose absolutely nothing. What you need to remember about coding is that it is hard to get into, it is, but once you're, land, you're in and gain the experience, you can practically set your course as to how far you want to go. Here's some of our course objectives. Module one consists of introduction to reimbursement, medical terminology, basic anatomy, introduction to ICD-9-CM, application of ICD-9-CM, introduction to ICD-10-CM. Module two will consist of introduction to CPT and HICSPIX, evaluation and management services, surgery and integumentary systems, anesthesia and modifiers, musculoskeletal systems, respiratory and cardio, female genital systems to include maternity care and delivery, general surgery included in general surgery will be ENT, ears, nose, and throat, male genital systems, the eyes, and the limbs. Now we're going to discuss reimbursement. Also we're going to talk about within reimbursement is compliance and HIPAA regulations. Each coding system plays an important role in reimbursement. The largest third party payer for reimbursement is, is Medicare. And everyone else seems to set the rules based on Medicare payments. Now the coder sole responsibility is to optimize this payment. In optimizing, this is not the same as maximizing. You wanna make sure that all data is accurate. You also want to make sure that you obtain correct reimbursement for services performed. Upcoding or maximizing is never appropriate, and we'll talk about that later. As the population changes, so does the thrive of healthcare industry. Population is shifting. You have a lot more elderly that are growing in the population is faster, uh, and people are living a lot longer. It's estimated by 2050, 20% of the population will be the elderly. And Medicare primarily pays for the elderly population. As a result to the increasing numbers of the elderly and technological advances and improved access to health care, there have been increased consumer use of health services. Well, by 2018, the national health care spending is expected to reach a record $4.4 trillion, and that, that is with a T. 
Healthcare will continue to expand to meet enormous future demands. In order to do that, you must understand how they plan to do this. Well, here's an overview of Medicare. First off, it was established in 1965, and it initially had only two parts, Medicare Part A and Medicare Part B. Now it includes Parts C and D. Your Medicare Part A covers only hospital payments. Part B are your physician services and medical equipment and all other services included. Part C are your Medicare Advantage services and more health care options, your supplemental insurances, if you will. And your Part D are your Medicare or your prescription drug management. So beneficiaries that are covered under Medicare are usually 65 years old or over. Uh, later on, they added the disability and the permanently um, renal disease failures and transplants that were added to the Medicare program. Here are some responsibilities of CMS. Well, CMS, which is Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, was formerly known as HICFA, the Healthcare Financing and Administration. The officiating office for CMS is the Department of Health and Human Services, or from also known as DHHS. CMS runs Medicare and Medicaid. This is a, a note that you need. Medicare and Medicaid are separate entities within the same big conglomerate of CMS, and we'll talk more about that later as well. Well, Medicare is ran by MACs, or Medicare Administrative Contractors, and they also have fiscal intermediaries or private insurances that run through or, or represent their um, payment systems. Now, the way Medicare is funded, and Medicaid or CMS, if you will, is through Social Security taxes. This is an equal match from the government and also from employer and employee taxes. So in turn, the Social Security Administration then gives CMS the money, who in turn sends the money to their Medicare administrative carriers and fiscal intermediaries who are responsible for paperwork and claim processing. Also, that's a very good note about Medicare coverage is the 80-20 rule. Well, Medicare pays 80% of all covered services. The beneficiary must pay 20% of the cost of services. In that, they'll pay an annual deductible, some premiums, all non-covered services, and beneficiaries often choose to purchase additional insurances to cover out-of-pocket expenses. Now, to help the beneficiary maintain certain costs, you have participating providers. We're going to go through what are participating providers and non-participating providers. First off, let's ask what are providers? Providers are your physicians, your non-physician practitioners or MPPs. You'll see that a lot, your physician assistants and your nurse practitioners and your, nurse, your certified midwives and things of that nature. Your providers can also be an entity like a hospital or other suppliers like a DME that provide care or services for Medicare beneficiaries. Your providers must be licensed by local and state health agencies to be eligible to provide services or supplies to Medicare patients. Participating providers must sign a participating provider agreement or a PAR with a fiscal intermediary to accept assignment on all claims submitted by Medicare, or to Medicare, excuse me. 50% of providers nowadays are participating providers, and they agree to accept what MAC pays as full payment. When you accept assignment as a provider, that means that you cannot bill the patient for the differences between what the services cost and what Medicare pays. In this example, you'll see this block 27 on the CMS 1500 shows where there's an option to accept assignment, whether yes or no. This is usually predetermined, and the, medic, the provider is accepting assignment, so that would be an automatic yes. A non-participating provider works differently. They are, um, their payments is sent directly to the patient, and also, non-participating providers receive 
5% less than a participating provider, meaning that they're not participating with the Medicare network, so they will receive 5% less than what a participating provider would with Medicare. Their claims process is a lot slower, and some non-participating providers will try to do a different or revolutionized package with patients, which is a deal between the patient and the provider called a concierge package. This means that their services, services are usually paid like a package deal. For instance, a provider may suggest a comprehensive workup and some vaccinations for the patient, and the patient will pay a certain amount to have those services covered. And that, that uh, service will not be billed to Medicare. It'll be billed automatically to the patient. The patient and the provider sets up a type of payment scale for that. Here's some benefits to a participating provider. Some providers ask why, but here are some great benefits. One, the PAR's fee schedules are 5% higher than that of a non-participating provider, and their checks are sent directly to the provider from CMS. You have a faster claim process, and their provider names are listed in the directory and sent to all of the beneficiaries. Unlike your non-participating providers, and MACs usually do not pay charges that non-participating providers submit. And that and that makes a significant decrease for the non-participating provider. Now we're going to talk about some of the programs that Medicare has. As I mentioned before, they have Part A, Part B, Part C, and Part D. We're going to go through Part A first. When you see Part A, think of hospital or think of building. That's the best way. Medicare is paying for the building that house the patient. The, the Part A portion for hospitals and SNF providers and also your uh, inpatient rehabilitation centers, they use, they report services for Part A by using the ICD-9s and the DRGs or Diagnosis Related Group Assignment. And they use it on, they put it on a claim called a UBO4, okay? Now, the MSDRG is called the Medicare Severity Diagnosis Related Groups. We'll talk about that a little bit later. However, let's go back to the UBO4. This is an assurance form used by inpatient facilities to submit claims. It is maintained by the National Universal, excuse me, National Univer Uniform Billing Committee, or the NUBC. Beneficiaries are automatically eligible for Part A when they become eligible for Medicare. Here's an example, a little snippet of a UBO form. As you can see here, you have the admitting diagnosis. This is your reason for visit. You also have your principal diagnosis. This is the reason after study as the cause to the patient or the underlying cause and condition. You also have your principal, principal procedure here. All of these, along with some others, uh, things that we have, criteria that we must go through for the inpatient side, uh, determine a certain amount of payment for your Part A services. We'll get into these more specifically a little bit later. Here are some of the covered expenses through Medicare, Medicare Part A. A semi-private room, your meals and special diets that's required, and all medically necessary services. You're going to hear me say medically necessary a lot. These are basically your no-frill stay. Part A does not cover TV, slippers, or non-medical, anything that's convenient for the patient outside of the purview that can be covered in their um, long-term care services. Rehabilitation and skilled nursing facilities also uh, are covered for Part A in that the patient condition must require daily skilled nursing services or rehabilitation. Some personal conveniences, as for mentioned, Items for long-term illnesses and disabilities are your home health visit and hospice care. If the patient is in hospice care, there are certain criteria that they have to meet in order for Medicare to pay for hospice. 